We're going to go through a really pacey series of short presentations. I will come back to that point for all my fellow presenters any second. But I'm delighted that we've got here uh, for big, the beginning of the session David Willits, the Minister of University of Science. David, thank you very much for joining us. And we're looking forward very much to hearing from you in a couple of minutes. We have a lot of exciting stuff to get through. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a long time since we've got together and showcased to such an important group of people as all of you what eSkills does. And we're doing it because we want you to be excited and think about how you can help in the mission we have, which is to make sure that the UK has the skills necessary to drive global competitiveness for the future. You know, we fundamentally believe that the, the IT and communication skills that are driving the modern digital economy are essential for all parts of the economy. And what we're looking for is to get you on the mission today by giving you lots of examples about how people's lives and life choices have been changed uh, by the things that these skills have done. We are a formidable force in the UK. We're still the sixth largest economy in the world despite our small size. We do pretty well at the Olympics too. We're the fourth largest in the OECD still behind USA, Japan and Germany. And that's a great thing. And we compare well in international terms around IT, but only about eight. So already you can see that we are shifting away from that. But this is a very important economy in two respects. You know, the ICT industry is 75 billion a year. That's 8% of the UK economy. But it contributes vitally to almost every other sector of the economy. And that's where the less good news comes in. We lag behind a long way, and our investment and utilisation in, in IT has been declining in the UK against people like the, our, our, our European friends in, in the Nordics in particular, who do very well, and the US, which very well. Just a simple statistic, the US headquartered companies are 8.5% more productive than UK headquarters companies. And the Office of National Statistics here says that 80% of that difference, 80% of that difference is down to investment in ICT. And there is therefore, let's be upbeat about it, a fantastic opportunity. There's something like a 47 billion um, GVA opportunity in the next five years ago. We've got very productive IT and telecoms workers, three times as productive as the average worker in terms of a gross value added per head. There's a, a benefit of continuing the great story about the UK online of around 22 million. But we have to have the skills to do it. We need to recruit about 130,000 people into the sector every year. And there are 116,000 vacancies during the first quarter, for example. But applications to higher education courses around IT have dropped 28% in the last 10 years, while overall courses have gone up 50%. This is completely in the opposite direction to what's going on in India, in Germany, and other productive economies. And the computing A level has basically been wiped out. You know, it's declined 61% over that 10 year period, and less than half percent of people take a computing A level. And there's a gender gap. It's bigger even than is represented by the people in this room. You know, only 15% of university students in computing are female, only 8% of people at A level. All of this is opportunity. You know, everybody associated with eSkills UK, which is a fantastic employer group <coughs> with all the senior people from the industry, but also senior people from finance, from retail, from high tech manufacturing, and all the other key sectors of the UK absolutely committed to making this opportunity work for the UK. Uh, but what I want to hear first from, please, is to give a big warm welcome to David, David Willits. He's got such a busy agenda. So delighted he could join us. David, over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Andy. It's great to be here. Um, grateful to Peter Jones for their hospitality this evening. 
Coming up here, we took quite a convoluted route, which seemed to involve going through most of the shopping floors <laughs> at quite slow speed. So I got the message, and I'm told the shop is open until 8 o'clock this evening. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got to be brief, and there's at least an hour shopping time afterwards if we're all disciplined about it. Um, so, thank you very much to Peter Jones uh, for your hospitality. Uh, and above all, thank you to eSkills, because what eSkills UK does is very important. and. It, the work of the Sector Skills Councils as a whole is very important, but as you've heard from Andy in his excellent presentation, there are particular challenges in IT and eSkills which we need to address. And that's just what eSkills UK is doing, and I very much appreciate the effort that's going on. Um, and the problem is that we on our side, and the government side, I think have been complicit in allowing the educational system, the curriculum, the examining system to drift away from the actual needs of industry. And it is, we should remember, it is scandalous that you can have a rapidly growing industry with, with growing employment prospects, but we're producing, we are producing people with GCSEs that put them off the subject A-levels that are in decline, and university degree courses with shockingly poor employment outcomes. This tells us that something has gone wrong with the alignment of our education and training system to match the needs of employers, and just as important, the aspirations of young people. So that's the problem that we have to tackle, and we can tackle it working together, government and e-skills together. And I think what we have done already shows that we can make progress working together. The old ICT curriculum has been disapplied, quite rightly. It, was, it, it had the shocking effect of making one of the world's most exciting technological advances seem boring. And it treated kids as if they were just customers, consumers, passive consumers, rather than giving them the skills necessary themselves to create and innovate. And I've been to some really exciting events where, for example, you've been competitions for young people for devising new mobile phone apps. And suddenly, instead of just going into the shops and buying a ringtone, they say, coming to Peter Jones to buy a ringtone, that of course is fine. Instead of going to the shops and, or online buying a new ringtone, they're thinking about what would be a useful app for my mobile phone, and they get a bit of the training that you need to write an app. And as we work with eSkills in the creation of the, of the new uh, GCSE and IT curriculum, it's that kind of approach we want, and the eSkills behind the screen initiative is really important on that. We need also to uh, improve the A-levels and to signal the A-levels that are the best route into uh, employment and into university. And one of the things we've got to make clear is that sometimes, well, not sometimes, almost always sticking with maths is the best single thing someone can do. And after years of working on education in, in various capacities, one of the most striking single empirical findings is that the premium for maths at all stages and in most employment ahead of any other subject is at least 10% and in some studies more than that. So sticking with maths. And for that, young people need to see what is required by universities and what the routes are. And again, we've made progress. Because in the old days, there was just a UCAS tariff system. The UCAS tariff didn't properly signal the relative value of different A-levels as a way into university. Something I proposed in opposition, which we've implemented in government, is we said to universities, you should release publicly the information on the actual A-levels that people have done in order to go and study that course. So they can see the usual, not necessarily automatic, but the usual routes in and can see, oh, that's interesting. So many of the people who did that course I was interested in did maths A-levels. That information is now available and out online. And then in higher education, there is more work to be done. And again, eSkills has made a really important contribution with the, the new information technology and management for business degree, which I strongly support and I think has been offered now at 14 universities 
in England and Wales. And it's great that you're doing that, but there is a lot more to be done. And one of my messages to universities and to employers is not to be embarrassed about getting together and being absolutely explicit, employers being absolutely explicit about what they need. Hewlett Packard, HP, I don't know if HP are represented here today, but HP got together with De Montfort University and have added some modules to the De Montfort University IT course that particularly meets Hewlett Packard's requirements so that you know, he's guaranteed a job, but they know if you've got those modules, you've had the software training that means that you are very likely to be employable for HP. And I say to employers, universities, many of them are up for that kind of dialogue. If there is something that you would like to see as a module in a university course, and you will in turn signal that this is a module that your company approves of, or that eSkills approves of on behalf of the entire sector, go for it. Universities will listen, and especially in the new, more competitive market in HE that we're creating, they have very powerful incentives to listen. Uh, and something else we can do is work with you on cyber security. And that's, again, an area where there is an enormous market opportunity. And <coughs> in talking to employers, one of the issues is getting the people with the right skills. And I personally would still remember vividly a conversation with uh, businesses, large and small, and other representatives of the cybersecurity sector out in the west of England, where there's a bit of a cybersecurity cluster. And uh, I think it was a police officer, an ex-police officer, said, what we really want is those teenage lads. I'm sorry, Andy, I'm about <laughs> to engage in a gender caricature, for which I apologize in advance. <laughs> but there may be, perhaps, teenage boys in their bedrooms who spend 23 out of 24 hours a day on their computers with a Coca-Cola and a pizza sitting there engaging in activities that might or not be um, uh, of, uh, criminal, who knows. But what they're certainly doing is they're <coughs> either involved in IT. And there is a massive choice. We don't want them to become hackers. We don't want them to go off limits and get a criminal record and be ejected from legitimate one. Those are absolutely people who, if we can reach out to them and get back on track, might well be brilliant employees in cyber school. So we've got to be a bit more imaginative. And I'm very pleased that the particular initiative which eSkills came up with on cyber security, a bid for co-funding that you put in to the government to provide a, a million pound starter fund for initiatives in cyber security training. We listened to eSkills, which is a great bid, and we have agreed that bid, so that will go ahead. So we can work together. There's a lot more to be done. Andy is absolutely right in those striking statistics that we offered. There is more to be done but we can do it working with you as business representatives. And what we're going to do is put more and more of the funding power in your hands or in the hands of learners. Our student reforms and our FE funding reforms are about putting more of the financial power in the hands of the student. And as we put more and more of the training budget directly in the hands of employers, and the employers represented here today who have, uh, I think, been successful in our first round of employer funding pilots. We put more funding in your hands, put more power in the hands of students, and do our bit in ensuring that the curriculum is related to the actual world of work, and I think we can rise to the challenge of, rate of improving our nation's skills in IT that Andy set out, and I very much look forward to working with eSkills as we tackle that together. Thank you very much. Indeed. I, I'd like to just recognise some of the things the Minister said there. I think we've seen very clearly um, since this government came to power a focus on making some choices, which is something we'd argued about uh, for a long time, that we need to really start to give people clear signals about what will help the economy, what will help growth, and take some, some um, real decisions. I think the direction that's of, of travel in terms of moving the way funding work so that it's much more re related the, the encouragement that we're getting to working with the higher education sector all these things are important uh, we are the next thing david on itmb because i think you probably won't be here when that bit comes up is to go for a 
a, a software science ITMB, effectively a higher scientific level ITMB at universities and there's really good work going on. I was very interested, as I was talking earlier on, the number of people who had been engaged in designing the ITMB from all the companies who are represented here. And I think that's the difference to get uh, people from industry actually involved in the design work is fantastic. Well, we're now going to be very logical and very straight through. So we're going to start from young and we're going to go through to older in life. So we're going to start thinking about all, all the points where we need to think about uh, involving how we can help people take the right <laughs> career decisions. We're going to start in the schools area because that's a logical place to start, I think. Um, the next three s sessions are all designed to demonstrate the work that we're doing with young people. We're trying to inspire them, and the point David made about the work that Stephen did on the mobile apps and the other things that have been going on from IBM is essential. We need to inspire people to realize just how central to the world technology is. Uh, and that's what all these three are about, inspiring people to want to take careers in IT and making sure that the curriculum they then get in school is inspirational and fit for purpose and academically rigorous and all those other things. So the first topic is probably our most famous program, uh, Computer Clubs for Girls. It's one of our most long-running program. And it's designed to help that imbalance question that we talked about. Just 18% of professionals in this industry are female. 136,000 10 to 14 year old girls have been through computer clubs for girls. That's a huge impact. But let's hand over some experts to talk about this. I want to hand over, if I may, for their <coughs> five minutes, I will be timing you, everybody, uh, to Elsa Beaton, the CIO of the Metropolitan Police, and Tiffany Hall, the technology controller at the BBC. Thank you. We look around, we see our teams and our colleagues doing great things, delivering stuff, making change happen. What we don't see is very many women. For Elsa and myself, we've had great careers and still having fun and faculty experiences working in IT. And for us, it's a huge shame that we're not seeing more women having the same sort of um, experiences and benefiting in the way that, that we have. We'd love to see more of them doing it, and that's what this is about. <laughs> But this isn't just an issue for us as individuals, it's an issue for our whole sector. If we're only attracting half the population, we're only getting half the talent, we're losing opportunities for growth of the sector because we just can't get enough people. So Tiffany and I are proud to be sponsors of CC4G, Computer Club for Girls, which is eSkills Youth After Schools Club, um, which is busy changing the attitude of a generation of girls. CC4G shows uh, that IT is fun, that it's interesting and that it's challenging. And it's relevant to the, their interests, whether that's sports or media or even solving <coughs> crime. And uh, Karen has asked me to tell you that details are in your pack and details are in your pack about how to sponsor um, a school if you, if you choose to do so. And what we're about to see is a film, um, and it's a film of, that, of CC4G in action. Um, it's a club that I sponsor, which is the Lillian Baylis Technology School in Pennington, South London. I think it's the projects that we get to do. Like we have the opportunity to do things that we wouldn't normally do like by ourselves. What I like best that we've done so far was um, I like the fashion show. We learned like how to present in front of people because like in our assemblies we had to like do a PowerPoint presentation about CC for I love the fact that they're developing their skills but without really knowing it. So it's not me sort of taking them through, oh this is what you need to do on PowerPoint. They have the freedom to kind of develop their skills and um, to use the program in different ways and um, to fiddle around with things as well that they wouldn't normally have used. PC for me, uh, it's not all about like computers and the girls um, really love what they do. They love coming here. They've developed their own projects based on what CC4G has on the website and 
they just love it so much and I love being a part of what they're able to produce really so definitely everyone should have one everyone should have one um, and now I'd like you to welcome Mr. Betterku and four girls from the Lydian Bailey School. Um, I think I'll go last. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what I enjoyed the most was that we got to practice our ICT skills. Like when we did events like the fashion show, we got to practice our skills via advertisement and things like that. What I like about the CC4G is that um, you get to put your own points across and stuff like that. And I like the new project we're doing about Black History Month. Um, <coughs> what I really enjoyed about the CC4G is How you doing guys? Um, so I'm the teacher for these young ladies who normally talk more than they're doing now. <laughs> uh, it's probably new for me to see them so quiet. Uh, what I liked about it was the fact that it allowed the, the young ladies to develop their skills as you saw in the video and what they really what they really took on was not just the aspect aspects of sitting in front of the computer but they enjoyed the fact that they actually got to bring their fashion show to real life. So we saw even more young ladies um, like this, that normally quite shy, bringing kids in, uh, organizing the show, talking to parents, bringing in dignitaries, and just the show. The show was actually a big success. We had about 150 students, um, you know, at that show, which is quite good. Um, what well, I think they all chose ICT as an option, which is good. So <laughs> hopefully they're all headed in the right direction. Um, but it was good to see them develop because what happened at the beginning we started with and we had a link with a young lady in industry who was a business owner so we kind of started from that bent so they all saw that it is possible to have a career in ICT and she was quite young I think Gemma she was about 27 <coughs> and she came in spoke to them which was a good inspiration and to show them the kind of direction that they can go in. So Phil, are you going to consider career in ICT in the future? <laughs> <laughs> good answer. <laughs> well done girls it's a really tough thing against this uh, this huge audience some of us get to do it all the time i was just as tongue-tied or maybe even more so than you when you at your age so look this is a very important part of, of what we need to do i think is to is to begin when people are quite young getting them interested in what technology does for society. It's the outputs that inspire people, not the technology. And I think, you know, it's a really good example, uh, the fashion show of how that can happen. Um, but we're not gender biased. And um, what we want to talk about now is a more general program. We have a website-based program, um, which is aimed at 14 to 19 year olds to get them understand what a career in IT is about. By the time you're 14 to 19, you actually want to know what it's going to be like at work. And that's what this is all about. So. What I want to hear, uh, I'm going to hand over to now is Richard Thwaite, who's the CIO of UBS, and uh, he's going to introduce a very inspiring young lady called Susanna Bath. Richard, where are you? Lost you. You are? Right in front of me.
Okay, so now, um, as Andy mentioned, I want to echo something that Ailsa and Tiffany touched on, which is, for those of us who work in IT, we think it's a fantastic profession. You know, we can't think of anything that could be more rewarding, dynamic, or exciting, any kind of career that's better than this. Um, but actually, we've found that not everyone else feels that way. Um, and, um, you know, eSkills did some research on it. I'm not sure why we all need this anyway, but they found that, yes, um, if you ask most people, they think that IT careers are boring. And if you talk to people, young people particularly, and you ask them what do they think people do in IT, then they conjure up an image of someone who's alone down in a darkened basement somewhere, hunched over a screen working on some arcane technical issue. So, so clearly as a sector, you know, we knew we had to address that. We had to do something about it. So we created Big Ambition. Um, a Big Ambition is a website, and it showcases IT. Um, what it's doing is everything to showcase really everything that IT has to offer. So the varied careers in all kinds of companies, large and small, and various types. Um, but importantly, you know, it uses things like videos, it uses games, it uses competitions, lots of interactive content. But I think most importantly, it showcases real people in real companies and they are talking in their own words about their IT jobs. And I think that's really important. Now it's also full of easy to access information about routes into IT and, and things you need like uh, the qualifications, education, um, apprenticeships, all that kind of stuff. It's attractive, it's lively, it's done in a very informative way. Um, and it's even girl friendly as well. Uh, so what I'll do is we'll show a quick video um, now and then we'll talk to Susanna who can hopefully explain a bit more in her words what she school of the help and knowledge about the industry is a really good resource for finding out not just information about for finding out information about the industry in my country and why I can do to get, to become more of it. case studies help find out a lot about how to get into the industry and Welcome someone who's enjoyed Big Ambition and who's taken a first step on a career in IT um, by undertaking a computing paper. So Susanna, you've used the uh, Big Ambition website, what do you think? Um, I thought it was really great. Um, I love the videos of all the people that work in IT, especially as they were um, really enthusiastic and really happy about their jobs. Um, it also had like, their CVs so you could see what kind of stuff they've done before their job. So the kind of work experience they had, the qualifications, whether they did a degree. A lot of them, in fact, actually went straight from A-levels, so that was really interesting um, and useful. And I love the company profile, so um, it shows just how essential ICT and computing is um, for basically every single company there is, which I think is great for people to know. Okay. Um, what made you interested in computing in the first place? Um, well, I've always used computers at home and I've always found them absolutely fascinating, how they work and um, everything that you can do with them. I did an ICT GCSE and I didn't really think much of the course, especially the coursework. Um, <laughs> but um, I thought that the theory we did about um, how computers work and the programming that we did um, was really interesting, so I wanted to can do that for A-level. And how are you finding that A-level computing course? Um, really interesting so far. We've done coding in JavaScript and Visual Basic, so it's really great to see the contrast between the two different <coughs> languages. Um, we've looked at things like algorithms, the theory of computers, so binary, hexadecimal, logic gates, all those kind of 
really big words that like <laughs> look really impressive. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it's great. <laughs> It's great to really understand that, and um, I'm looking forward to the rest of the course. We're um, going to Bletchley Park soon, um, which, if you don't know, that's like the Enigma decoding machine, um, and we might be going to New York as well to see some businesses and how they use IT. Now, any thoughts on IT career? Because there's probably a few people out here who are writing your name down. <laughs> <laughs> so convincing. Yeah, I'm definitely really considering it because it looks like such, as well as being a really um, stimulating, exciting and varied career, it's also something that will always be needed by companies, so that means great job security, especially in this economic climate, so yeah, I think it would be a really great career. Okay, so that, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard and Susanna. Um, I haven't really got anything to say. So everybody agrees with Susanna about the ICT um, uh, O-level, uh, GCSE, sorry, I'm sorry how old I am. <laughs> um, and including the employers and the universities and everybody who takes it. S and it's because of what Susanna said. You know, what mainly is taught is what's on the screen and what people find really interesting is how does it work. So. Um, with no more ado, I'm going to hand over for their five minutes, just to remind you everybody, to Stephen Leonard, the CEO of UK and Ireland for IBM, and Philip Oliver, the CEO of Blitz Games. All right. Thanks, Andy, and good evening, everybody. Um, when, I, when I got involved in the Behind the Screen project, what, what really interested me in Behind the Screen was that this was a collective effort where eSkills used their convening power to do something that couldn't have been done without the collective effort <coughs> together. And I think that was the thing that really interested me in this, in this initiative. Um, what was the purpose of it? Well, first of all, and we've seen and we've heard some of the comments tonight, um, the IT GCSE as it existed, we felt did not serve the purpose that it was set out to serve. And if you spoke to any of the stakeholders, whether it be the, uh, um, the, 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 uh, the, the teachers, the people in industry, um, people in education, and in fact the students themselves, it, it was not something that was highly valued. It was not something that was highly valued. The students, the most important piece, they were at a decrease of 57% since 2005 in students taking the IT GCSE. So it was clearly something wrong. So what did we do? Well, we got the team together. We invited some, uh, some people from, uh, from uh, schools and from uh, the education and from academia. And we spent a bit of time together. And we decided that we needed a curriculum that put IT at the heart of enabling modern business and modern society. Because essentially that's what it does. And I don't need to tell all of you that that's what it does. We wrote to the uh, Minister of Education um, and we laid out our plan. So uh, how we felt as an industry together we could change this GCSE, make it relevant, and make it of value to its key stakeholders, to the employers, to the people who do the education, and most importantly, for the students themselves. And part of that, and I'm glad to say the minister agreed with us, and he said that we should do a pilot. Um, part of that pilot was to create um, experiences, challenges, which allowed students to learn about IT in its broadest sense. Um, we've got 80 schools in the program now, who are participating with us and they're helping us create the curriculum, as well as many people in this room who've contributed a lot of resource, a lot of experience and a lot of skill to making this project happen. One of the very first challenges um, was one that we created with IBM, which was to create an app with our partners at the All England Lawn Tennis Club for our first time competitor at Wimbledon. That app would help them you know, book practice time, book transportation, and all the things that probably a first-time competitor found hard to do. Um, we set a challenge out to the schools, and we actually put a prize up. And one of the schools, I'm pleased to say, won that prize, and that prize was to spend a day at Wimbledon, um, not just ad admiring the tennis, but looking at what technology does in helping the All England Club serve Wimbledon in its widest sense. Um, that school was the Georgia Fern School, and we're going to hear from them, they've produced a little video themselves, to talk about their experience and how that's framed. We're going to hear from them in a second. Um, after that, we're going to hear from uh, Philip, who's the founder and CEO of Blitz Games, and he's going to talk about the challenge that they created. But before I finish, I think it would be remiss of me not to uh, recognize the efforts of Lord Lucas, who's with us this evening. Um, Lord Lucas has been a campaigner of IT education in schools for quite some time now. 
and has been a trailblazer. And I think on behalf of eSkills and everybody here, Lord Lucas, we'd like to thank you for your pioneering effort in getting us this far. Because without you, we would definitely not be as far down the line as we would be. So with that, we're going to play the video. Thank you. Now let me tell you how I got inspired. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Blitz Games and you'll kind of see where I'm coming from. So I've got a twin brother, Andrew, and we were teenagers back in the early 80s and we came across Pac-Man and Space Invaders and had a real passion for playing them, but we were, some people were so obsessed, um, <laughs> but very quickly we kind of figured that actually it was so fascinating that we wanted to create some, something like this. We wanted to create our own games. And in fact, that um, obsession led to us learning all those skills and putting an enormous amount of dedication into learning the, the skills to make a <coughs> video game. And in fact, we went on to win TV competitions. And by the age of 20, we had many bestsellers, big house, big company, started employing, I say big company, a company, and we started employing people. Now, today, we've got um, over 200 staff, still a private, independent company, and all these people are passionate about video games and have all those creative and technology skills. We wish there were more of them, which is why I'm here. Now, back in the 80s, there was a generation that effectively leads a lot of our technology industry in the UK today. They were inspired by the likes of the big computers, especially the BBC Micro. And unfortunately, from the 90s through to today, today we've actually put them off um, learning those skills. They play the games, but they've got no interest and no entry point for actually making those games. Um, so we've kind of lost, unfortunately, a lot of people who we could have inspired. But that's what eSkills UK is going to do. We're going to put back that, um, that challenge, that inspiration, back to them, back in the classroom, and we're absolutely delighted to have worked with these skills and with BAFTA to put together a challenge for the kids to make a video game. Uh, let's see the film. Hi, I'm Andrew Oliver, the co-founder of Blitz Games Studios, and I hear you're up for a challenge for creating a brand new character-based video game. Excellent, good for you.
it's important because it will define every aspect of your game design, the visuals, the setting, the mechanics, the story, the script, the animations and the gameplay itself. When thinking about core gameplay design, the best place to start I find is to think about the coolest thing that the player can do from moment to moment over the course of the game. Uh, since this will be the thing that the player spends most of the time doing, there will be something in the concept that, that inspires you and excites you about the idea. So jump on that and run with that and see what the coolest thing the player can do for the whole game is. So, I have to say that um, several people have already mentioned that young people today have been disengaged by the IT curriculum and have this group. But I have to say I defy any young people to be uninspired by what we can create with behind the screen and with, with these kind of challenges. Um, I am, they're exciting challenges, they're stretching challenges, um, they will inspire. And I think that the rich materials that we are producing for this will inspire the next generation um, to actually learn those skills required in the 21st century. And okay, we're using the games as a kind of a, a hook, but actually all the skills they will learn through, through these games to try and create the game, they're very kind of overall skills that can now be a quite the industry. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Stephen and Philip. Um, we could do with tightening up a little bit everybody on the timing otherwise the shop will be well closed by the time we, uh, we finish so uh, <coughs> keep going the, the first three sessions therefore have been about young people we've still got one more to come on that and that's really looking at, at what David Willits mentioned the ITMB <coughs> now got 850 students in 14 universities and I want to hand over to Craig Will Wilson from uh, uh, um, uh, Hewlett Packard, thank you. You're not called that anymore. HP and, uh, and Andrew Turnbull, who's the ITMB course director, and uh, two graduates, Pat D'Souza and Sarah Collins. Uh, thanks, Andy. Uh, I just want to start by um, trying to uh, explain the problem that we were trying to solve when we created the ITMB, the IT uh, Management for Business uh, degree. So around uh, 10 years ago, uh, all of the top employers in IT in the UK uh, were coming together and identifying the same problem, which is that uh, although we uh, had a huge demand for IT skills, uh, the IT graduates that we're getting from the universities didn't give us one vital ingredient, and that's uh, something that I think is common for, I suspect, most of our businesses. We're looking for really two things. One is the, the depth of understanding of what IT can do for you but also the ability to combine that with soft skills and business skills and then bring that uh, power uh, to our customers and to our um, uh, businesses. We created the uh, IT management for uh, business degree um, out of that uh, need. I'm pleased to say that uh, 10 years later, I think the first cohort was in 2005, there are now 14 uh, universities around the UK that offer ITMB. Uh, I'll talk at the end a little bit about the, the result that we uh, get from that. And that program is so successful uh, in large part because it's supported directly by more than 60 employers uh, in the UK. Can I introduce Andrew Turnbull from the University of Northumbria? Uh, and Andrew will tell us a lot more about how ITMB operates in practice. Okay, yeah. Well, at Northumbria, we had this history of innovating business IT degrees, we had a relationship with these skills already. So in 2004, we were very keen to take advantage of this opportunity to get involved in this ITMB degree with this high level of industry engagement. Particularly when, as has been said before, so many applications, so many computing and IT degrees were losing their applications. So we designed the degree from scratch to meet this industry specification and we offered it for the first time in 2005. Now our first cohort is fairly small, but the numbers have grown each year, and we now have good-sized classes, and we're delivering some excellent graduates. Now, there is actually a large HP office in Newcastle, um, so this means that Craig and HP have been major beneficiaries of the ITMB degree already, as, in fact, have most of the employers in this room. Example. 
throughout the time up here. So my name is Pat Caesar. I'm a 2010 ITMB graduate from Manchester University. My story is that I actually changed course whilst at university to go on to the ITMB program. Um, the reason being was that three reasons. The course offered a unique combination of IT, business and project management skills. In addition to the attraction that the course was designed and sponsored by employers. Um, having done that, I've never regretted my decision doing that. The great thing about the course is it challenges students to combine IT and business knowledge together to solve real world problems. Um, the, so the development of soft skills through the emphasis on group project work um, is unrivaled by any other degree, in my opinion, um, coming from peers at university, whether it's IT or a non IT degree. Having met an HR representative at an ITMB event, and having done the internship and recently completed the graduate scheme, um, I'm now a full-time credit Swiss employee. And I'd say that I feel like I excel my job, mainly down to the fact that uh, it's down to the foundation of skills that ITMB has laid for me. You could say that the ITMB degree is uh, modern, unique, and therefore special. Students that graduate come out with such desirable skills that um, employees look for. And you could say that no other degree can compete against ITMB in terms of having students that are more industry ready. Not well, I don't so. Hi, um, I'm Sarah Collins. I'm also an ITMB graduate from Cambridge University. Um, I have been working in
the, the number is double, but still not where it should be, but 33% of the cohort in ITMB uh, are girls. So it's beginning to address that problem, uh, that issue uh, as well. And the results are superb in that 100% of ITMB graduates are today are employed in 2011 of all of the graduates that have gone on to do further degrees or every single one of them uh, today is employed, which sadly we can't say for all uh, degree output. Andy, thank you. Thank you very much, Craig. Thank you very much for everybody. Uh, I think it's a, a classic example of having something which could make a real difference here and you know we're, we're focused on growing the number of universities doing ITMB focused on growing the number of courses like that which are sponsored by employers but it's not the only way to start an IT career and I think apprenticeships are becoming increasingly popular IT and telecoms apprentices starts rose 43 percent between 2008 and 2011 uh, compared with a 17 percent increase across all sectors um, and there are now more than 6,000 people doing IT apprenticeships. Uh, and I think that's, you know, fantastic. Completion rates have gone up too. There have been pretty poor examples of this up until this point. But rather than keep hammering on, I'll hand over, I hope, Phil Smith. Hello, Phil. <laughs> From Cisco, Phil. Yeah, good evening, everybody. And um, I, so I, I'm slightly concerned on the basis that Andy said we're starting from young part of the agenda <laughs> and I'm on towards <laughs> the end of the agenda. So anyway, and my cohorts who are joining me, of course, I would share with that. <laughs> so actually, just very quick, I mean, I, apprentices um, clearly is, a, 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 a for us, particularly in our industry, somewhat um, novel, I think. And, uh, you know, certainly Cisco only really in the last couple of years that we started the apprenticeship program. And without going into the detail of that, because we're going to talk in a second, one of the characteristics that's been absolutely striking about that is the gender mix is 60-40 in favour of females. Right, so that's very powerful for us and really is, we think, a fundamental change in, the, in both role modelling and applying people into... Uh, into our business going forward so absolutely striking but I'd like to welcome up for a little mini panel for 11 minutes as it says in the agenda but we'll try and make it slightly shorter Andy good thank um, you I'd like to welcome <laughs> up um, uh, Stephen Leonard who's Chief Executive of IBM who you've seen already hey Stephen M Andy Nelson who's the government CIO and CIO of the M MOJ and uh, also Clive Selly from uh, as the CEO of BT Innovate so welcome everybody so I'm um, actually guys we wanted to just briefly talk about um, about apprenticeships. As I said, actually, I think apprenticeships have not been strong in our industry. Many other industries have done a much better job, Stephen, and maybe you could talk a little bit about apprenticeships in, <coughs> in IBM. You know, why did you start an apprentice program and just broadly what you're getting from it? Um, <coughs> so first of all, I mean, we fundamentally believe that the issue that we have in this country and this country's economy right now is not a jobs problem, it's a skills problem. And if you look at um, IT and uh, the I IT enablement of business and society as a whole, um, you know, the more skills we can create, we passionately believe the more jobs we'll create and the better that will be for the UK economy. <coughs> so this program just made perfect sense to us. We've had graduate recruitment programs and student programs for a, a long, long time. We recruit between 300 and uh, 500 uh, students on, a, on, a, on average every single year into one of our programs or another. So when the team came to me and said, we've got this great opportunity to start bringing um, apprentices on board, it was just another route that opened up for us, that gave us access to skills and talent that we was shut to us before. Um, important things that we felt were required as we developed this program, that these individuals were full-time employees from day one. We didn't you know, somehow say to them, you're here for six months or two years, and then you may or may not get a job. We said to them, from day one, you're a full-time employee. Um, incredibly, um, our first uh, cohort they've gone through, and there was 14 of them. We now have 104, by the way. We've only been going two in about years. Um, we'll take a bunch more on this year, probably another 20 to 40, depending on where we can find them. Um, <coughs> but incredibly, the first 14 have uh, graduated with their qualification five months ahead of schedule. Five months ahead of schedule. And this is while doing a full-time job, right? I mean, we have them out there billing clients, doing client-facing work. As well as studying for as well as studying for this formal uh, this formal qualification, so it's been a great program for us. It's been a great program for the students. Um, I think it's been an absolute revelation to the rest of the people in the company. We've got a fantastic gender mix in it, and uh, it's something that we're going to invest in more heavily as we go forward, for sure. I mean, 
That's clearly great news. And uh, one of the things that's characterised, I think, apprenticeships in recent times is a, a kind of unprecedented support from government, you know, both in, in, in uh, uh, stating their support, but obviously making it easier for employers. And maybe, Andy, you could give us a bit of a sense, not only of that support, but actually, I as an employer yourself, a huge employer, just how applicable the kind of apprenticeship skills might be in, in government IT. So Certainly, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I'm here in a number of hats, so I work in government CIO and Ministry of Justice CIO in you know, times of austerity, you've got to do multiple jobs. Um, <laughs> but uh, within that, another hat I wear is head of the IT profession, and within government we run that through an IT profession board, and that's something that represents central government, local government, but also brings in industry, um, it brings in BCS and so on, so it's a group that does that. And there are a number of strands of activity in there, in, and it's all about driving up the capability of IT in government. And a kind of the entry point, two parts of that, graduate schemes, um, and briefly on that, we're tiny. Um, we've kind of run a scheme for um, many years, and I celebrated doubling it this year, and we've recruited 25 people, Stephen, which is, you know, we've got to do a lot more, so I want to double it again. And certainly apprenticeships is another key part of that. So like many of us, you know, how can we bring more people in? Where do we start from? Um, quite modest, but some interesting pieces, so be it in DWP, schemes are sort of an intermediate level, so the lowest level of apprenticeship and brought people in, small numbers of people. At the next level, in terms of advanced, um, across Ministry of Defence, Ministry of Justice, Home Office, in the case of Ministry of Justice, uh, one of my teams actually here has been at the heart of this scheme, there it was about actually looking in the prison service, and actually have people and um, trying to help in the prison service employees there. And what you actually found for suppliers and HPs here who do this, well, you can't just turn up as prison as an engineer and just trying to make the call. No surprise, you get caught through security and all the kit you might want to bring through the door, you can't do that. So actually a more effective model, have somebody on the ground. So we created a workforce and developed them and so on to be apprentices. And they're kind of the local IT expert for the prison, the governor and all the team in there to solve local problems. So that's kind of a good baseline to move forward from. We're then working with departments now to go, this is actually a real source of growing people. Start to identify all well, the different skill types, where can we work with different departments to actually bring in more apprentices. As we do that, actually saying well, we need to work with other groups to help us do this. So we've actively engaged with industry, so working groups in industry, which would have people like probably people in the room, Cap Gemini and IBM and others in this who are also trying to drive these apprenticeship schemes. You know, we in government would go, can we work together with you and what those schemes look like? Um, can actually take advantage of them, frankly. So if you're actually running courses and schemes, you know, can I send along a few apprentices onto you know, some of Stephen's courses and go and actually drive that versus you know, can we actually create our own courses? Beyond that, working with these skills in terms of the gold standard apprenticeships, working with the National Apprenticeship Service, so term to make sure that what we're trying to do is in line with broader apprenticeship needs. So there's no doubt it's a key part of, kind of the start of a career, one aspect of driving IT, IT capability. I think there's certainly a real future for it in government. Excellent. And I, I think, you know, the, the, as Andy briefly referred to that, I mean, the gold standard apprenticeship program and the commitment of e-skills to driving apprenticeships is something, you know, we are very committed to. So those of you who are not aware of, you know, e-skills place in here, please take the time afterwards. There's plenty of folks from e-skills who will be happy to talk to you about what, what's involved in that. And um, Clive, you're the one who really bucks the trend in terms of our industry. You know, we've been running an apprenticeship program for a long time, you've, you've BT have done an amazing um, job in apprenticeships. And in fact, you're taking another level now by helping other companies, particularly small companies, I think, to engage with the apprentice program. Maybe you could share a little bit with that, of that with us, please. Okay, so at, at BT, the apprenticeship program is, as you say, very well established. A large number of uh, people have been through it, and, uh, and the business case for it is very well proven. Um, we find that those who've come through the apprentice program stay with the company, they're loyal, and we get to enjoy their skills um, over many years, so the payback is definitely there. Um, we have extended the number of domains in which we now use the program, um, so we now use apprentices in um, uh, the new and advanced product areas, so we now have apprentices um, in areas way beyond our sort of core network technologies. Um, examples of that would be uh, in cyber security. So we have um, young apprentices training up in new skills um, which we have in short supply and for which our customers you know, are demanding more. It's, a, in, it's an expanding part of our marketplace. Um, we're also using um, apprentices now in our um, TV developments. So we're building platforms for the delivery of TV over uh, fibre broadband um, and in, in, in those areas 
Um, they work oftentimes with small companies in our supply chain. So more and more our apprentices are coming in contact with um, other technology companies, often local technology companies, British technology companies that are working in those same areas. Um, and we're extending our pool of applicants, and we have you know, very large numbers of applicants for our apprenticeship programs with some of those SMEs. So we're trying to share the pool, the prospective pool of candidates, um, and, and, uh, um, and have them fish in that pool that we've vetted for them. So thank you, Clive. I mean, in an effort to keep the agenda back on track here, we'll just say that I think, you know, it, there's a huge enthusiasm, I think, from industry about apprenticeships, maybe particularly in our industry, something that hasn't been addressed to the degree it should. Um, I think you can see from here that there's some, in, uh, there's some uh, you know, great steps being taken <coughs> forward. It ad potentially addresses some of the challenges we have in the, in the supply chain overall, and I think it's something that uh, certainly merits more work from eSkills and hopefully support from you here in the audience and industry generally. But thank you very much to my panel, and we'll uh, hand back to Andy. Phil, thank you very much. I think you know, it is one of those things that's really changed, I think, as a result of what eSkills have been doing, the approach to the industry around apprenticeships. I think it's really important. Um, now we're going to move on from new talent to the talent in the workplace already, and what are we doing to support them and, and develop them. And um, before we do that, just wanted to pay tribute to Paul Kobe here, uh, who has kindly hosted this whole event and his team have been fantastic. Paul uh, Paul is IT director of John Lewis. Anybody didn't know, we're in a John Lewis premises. Uh, and with him is Gaynor Hart from Quicksilver and they're gonna take us through uh, what we're doing in the area of raising standards through the IT Academy. Thanks very much, Andy. Um, when we set out to create the National Skills Academy for IT, we had uh, two clear aims. First, to develop a set of industry standards by which all IT professionals could benchmark themselves and identify the skills and qualifications by which uh, th that would best further their careers. And secondly, our aim was to increase the overall skills levels across the whole IT profession particularly focusing on how we could support smaller companies. I'm delighted to say that the IT Skills Academy has been working tirelessly to support these aims with a very wide range of activities that help employers, individual IT professionals and also training providers. But this evening I'm going to give you some insights into what the Academy is doing by focusing on just two of our services. The Skills Academy's subscription service and the IT professional profile. To tell you about the subscription service in more detail and uh, how it's helped her IT services company, I want to hand over to Gaynor Hart from Quicksilver. Thanks, Paul. Um, just a little background first, very quickly. Um, Quicksilver is an independent UK based um, uh, provider of systems integration and messaging products and services mainly to the health sector. And we are a small company of 39 people. One of um, our constant issues is providing um, high quality training to our people in a flexible way. Um, and being small, we don't have those economies of scale to be able to afford um, that kind of training. Well, we, we certainly haven't um, in the past. Um, with the, uh, the National Skills Academy IT subscription service, um, we've found a solution to that. Um, it, it's a, a solution to issues that a lot of small businesses most probably find themselves in a, in a similar situation. Um, we, through the subscription service, have access to um, training courses from world-class e-learning providers um, and we can offer that to our IT professionals. Um, because it's e-learning, it's also flexible, and so for a small company, um, we can access the training when the resource is available to, to do that training. Um, the, the other thing about it is the, the cost. It's affordable. The subscription service is something I can afford, which, which is great. 
um, and, and it gives me access to the training um, that has previously only been available to the large organisations. So that's uh, that's a real bonus too. Um, but we have got a short video um, which um, shows the opinions of my staff, the people who are using it, and so I'll let them speak for themselves. Silver, we've been using the subscription service since October 2011. It was a great solution to provide our staff with high quality learning that allowed them to complete the courses around other commitments. So far, 14 members of staff have regularly used the site, many of them achieving new IT certifications or using it to identify a course that will allow them to move up to the next step of their career ladder. The support to gain new skills and develop my career is a hugely motivating factor at work. The subscription service available at Quicksilver enables me to very easily identify and agree with my manager the training needs which I have in my current role but also for my future aspirations. The great thing about the subscription service is it gives a very nice framework and a shopping list to be able to uh, work with the individuals to try and marry up what is available against what they're looking for. So it's been very useful in that sense that it, it gives you something to start honing in on. Um, and I think everyone's enjoyed that part of it. The subscription service for the National Skills Academy for IT really helped me to work towards my uh, Certified Information Security Manager uh, certification. I found the flexibility uh, from being able to study at home as well as in the office was great. It really helped me to fit in studying around my other work and life commitments. The ability to provide e-learning of such variety, um, usually only available to a large organisation, I see as a great way of ensuring that we attract and retain the best staff. In our um, quarterly staff reviews of individuals, managers can use the tool to discuss and suggest training with uh, individual members of staff. You know what meets their their aspiration uh, for their future, and of course that's great for staff retention. Um, and the whole the whole system, the whole setup is great for the company's bottom line. Thanks very much, uh, Dana. Um, you know, it's a great insight, I think, uh, into you know just one of the initiatives. Uh, from the IT Skills Academy, uh, particularly aimed at smaller organisations and upskilling uh, their people as you've seen. And now I want to just turn to the second point, our newest service, the IT Professional Profile. Uh, this is a development that uh, we're very excited about at the uh, um, <coughs> IT Academy. What we've set out to do is to provide a way for IT professionals to easily benchmark their skills, your skills, in a consistent way across the entire IT industry. We'd seen that much of the talent and ability within IT individuals wasn't always as visible as maybe you would find with professionals in other sectors. And that this causes difficulty both for individual IT professionals in defining their future development and also for organisations, employers, in understanding their skill set. So to address this problem, the National Skills Academy develop the IT professional profile. This is an online tool which is used by individuals and employers. Since this time last year, individual IT professionals have been using this system free of charge. They use it to assess their own skills and complete a personal profile which they can then share online with their employer, their teammates and indeed recruiters. So today we are launching the corporate version of this tool. This allows employers to gather skills profiles from their team and view and compare the skills across their whole organisation. As you will see in this short video, employers are already seeing real benefits in using this tool. For staff development, skills planning, training and development and also recruitment. It's quick and easy to use and could very easily be linked into the training and subscription services offered by the Academy.
professional profile is a, a critical tool for us in helping our people assess their skills against the next level benchmark. Uh, it helps us develop plans for them, put in place continuous improvement uh, and development plans for them. It allows us to assess people individually and collectively as a team, which is absolutely vital in terms of building the necessary skills going forward. We are the largest Indian IT company. Um, people make our reputation and we recruit the best of the talent from the market and invest in them. This year we plan to engage 50 plus graduates and graduates as our business grows. We are going to use the IT professional uh, profile in our recruitment process to understand the skills and the experience of the people who apply for the job with TCS. To assist us in managing the large population of IT people in our supply base, we are looking to use the IT professional profile to help us understand and develop the skills that our IT suppliers use. We're also investigating the use of the IT profile to help us when we recruit IT professionals to make sure that we can better match their skills with our needs. Well, John Lewis these days is really a technology-enabled business. Well, we've started using the IT professional profile by asking each candidate to set out their skills and then we can compare that very easily with the proof profile of the job that we're recruiting for. We think the IT professional profile is an excellent tool to use because it's objective, it's clear, it's online. It enables candidates really to express what they can do for us and it absolutely fits with the values of the John Lewis Partnership. A professional profile can help us to mitigate any risk that a skills gap is a threat to delivery of any of the key accountabilities of one of the teams in the department. I think what we can gain from the reporting on the IT profile is first of all, because it's quite simple and visually presented, it, it means that people are going to engage with the tool. The professional profile gives us a, uh, the opportunity to ensure that we've got exactly the right skills for all of the things that we've got in flight at any particular moment. I hope from uh, that video you can see uh, why we at the Skills Academy believe that the IT professional profile is going to be an invaluable tool to both IT professionals and their organisation. In fact, we believe so strongly in the merits of the IT professional profile that I can announce today that employers right across the IT sector have put their backing behind the use of IT professional profile within their organisation. For example, Morrison's who saw there will be asking their IT employees to complete an IT professional profile to assist with skills development and performance improvement. Tata Consultancy Services will make it a requirement for graduate recruitment applicants. HP will be encouraging their contractors to provide an IT profile so they can easily evaluate their skills against the need of the business. And here at John Lewis, we will be requesting all preferred job candidates to complete a profile before we meet them for interview. Um, there's a press notice in the packs on your desk and an uh, easy link uh, in order so you can find out how you too uh, can uh, join the IT professional profile and how your organisation can also participate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul and Gaynor. It's been fantastic in listening to many people um, from the industry and from around the UK who contribute really highly to what uh, eSkills UK does. You know, it is very much an employer-led organisation. That's where its value comes from. But listening to all of the things we've talked about, you would think, wouldn't you, there was an army of people, you know, hundreds of hundreds of people beavering away doing all these things. It's, you know, we have an impact here right across from people at school right the way through to people in the workplace across a vast range of programmes all that work and behind it is a lot of really significant work on understanding what the trends are in the industry, the statistics we've been using, the national occupational standards and much, much more. But actually it's a very small team, about the same size as Gainer's team, one which creates a fantastic impact. And I wanted particularly at this moment to say thank you very much to all of them. You know, they work really hard. Uh, we come up and stand up as public faces, but the real work goes on in that team and they are brilliantly led by our next speaker, Karen, come on up.
Andy, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the thanks, and especially on behalf of the team, because I would like to echo their hard work as well. Uh, now, Chairman, I'm going to be very quick, yes, <laughs> to get us back on time. Um, when we first conceived the idea of this event, um, we very much wanted to make it a celebration event. Um, and I think we are here to celebrate, and I'd like to pause and celebrate. Um, you've seen um, some of the things we've been doing. We haven't had time to share everything. Um, from the work that the Minister mentioned on cybersecurity, we're working hard on cybersecurity skills to make sure that the UK retains and achieves its potential to be world class as a global centre of excellence in cybersecurity, right through to the other end of the spectrum, where we're working with employers on digital literacy skills to ensure that everybody in society has the skills they need to access learning, to access jobs, to access government services. So we haven't been able to show you everything. But we are so proud of what we've done and the impact we're having. And of course, it's not just us. It's not just the speakers you've heard. It's you in the room and that partnership that has made this happen. And there's people who've been unable to be with us tonight as well. So I want to say a thank you to the schools and those pioneering teachers who are prepared to make a difference. The colleges in the room, we've got universities in this room. You took a big risk when you took on ITMB. Um, and thank you for it. I'm glad we've proved right in the end. But it's those sorts of things. There's training <coughs> providers here who are really working and they're making apprenticeship programs work for the sector. There's the partnerships with the trade associations are here. The professional bodies are here. Governments here, ministers are here. It's everybody together. And I just want to say an enormous thank you because we couldn't do it without you. And if I may, without getting too oscar -y, I do want to say a personal thank you to the board. Um, their commitment sees us through some wobbly times. Andy, I'd like to thank you as our chair as well um, for your vision, your leadership, and also your perseverance with us at times. We're very <laughs> grateful, not to say patience. Um, so it's a thank you, and it's a celebration. <coughs> But just to conclude, I'm really hoping, I know Paul probably wants you shopping, um, <laughs> but there is a glass of wine shortly, so I'd love you to stay so you can accept that thank you. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is that there's, of course, a lot to do. Um, and Andy talked about the economic imperative. We've got to accelerate, we've got to scale these initiatives we're making. Um, but what I find very odd is it feels that the wind has turned in our direction. We had the announcement from the Department for Education about reforming the school curriculum. Thanks very much to Rafe in terms of championing that through. But we've got some traction there. We have tremendous support from the UK Commission for Employment and Skills. They're here tonight. They support our sector and back it tremendously. Um, uh, the Minister referred the priority that his department is putting on the sector. And for the first time ever, Vince Cable, a Secretary of State, stood up a couple of weeks ago and talked about a government industrial policy and how the government was going to focus on sectors for growth. Yes, he did talk about green. Yes, he did call, talk about creative. But for the first time ever, we were there. IT is going to be a priority sector for government. And we've got some people from this here. And you know, we're on your doorstep shortly to work out where we take that forward. And strange things happen as well, yes. You know, you may have heard that we've now got a Will I Am of Black Eyed Peas working with Simon Cowell um, to do a television programme. You know, this is all chatting around at the moment um, to find the next tech entrepreneur. Um, you know, they're after creating the next Bill Gates or Zuckerberg or what have you. Now, that is a bit odd, but I have decided, um, you know, I have decided that we are in the news, we're on everybody's radar, and it has to be a good thing. And uh, Will I Am has said, to quote him, um, this will create thousands of jobs, whereas X Factor creates only one star. So on that note, I'm going to hand over, segue into Ollie Benzakri of Accenture, <laughs> who obviously is a star in his own right, um, but he's going to tell you a little bit about our plans for filling those jobs by tackling youth unemployment. Ollie.
Thank you. I feel I ought to sing or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, the, um, <coughs> the very good news is I think I am the last speaker, and I think you'll sum up. So, so we're nearly to the last one, and we're nearly to the topic call. Um, I suppose the bad news from my point of view, though, is that since I'm the last, and we were talking about ascending age. That's <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm older than everybody. <laughs> Luckily, I was going to say Andy follows me. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I want to just spend literally two minutes just talking about things we're going to focus on in the future, um, and particularly a program around youth unemployment. Um, I mean, it's not escaped anyone's attention, I don't think, that we have a big problem in youth unemployment. Um, the figures are something like 1.4 million uh, needs in, in education, employment, or training. 22% uh, of 25-year-olds actually not in employment. It's a very big issue, um, and it has huge societal implications. So we don't do something about it. Um, at the same time, you've heard actually quite a lot of people talk about the fact that we have huge demand for technology digital jobs. I think Andy used to figure about under 30,000 um, folks a year, and I think the figure was 120,000 vacancies in the first quarter. Um, so there's a huge demand out there. Um, and somehow, we need to link these two things together. Um, because if we can, we can make a huge difference. Um, and I believe as a sector or sectors, we can do exactly that. Um, and I think we are talking about a vision of being effectively the leading sector in handling youth unemployment. Because actually, as, as a sector, we have to recognize the issue. We actually have a huge amount of demand for skills um, and actually, a lot of the things that take the level of schools we have within our control. So we can do a huge job of making a difference. I think as individual employers, we do try to do um, Certainly with Accenture, uh, we have this thing called Skills Succeed, uh, which is targeted young people to help them get the skills they need um, to either be employed or start a business. And actually, would have impacted really the, something like 9,000 people last year. So we, we do that. I know that IBM do stuff, I know that Microsoft do stuff, I know that Cisco do stuff, so I've lost you wherever you are in the audience. We all do our little bit. Um, the key, I think, though, is how can we add that together? Because I think as a, as a group of companies, group employees, we can actually take what is small parts and make the sum very much bigger. But we actually work in a very fragmented way. Um, so I'm delighted that these skills is actually standing up to this particular thing too. These skills have, have achieved a huge amount of this, as you've heard all evening. Um, so now we're going to achieve a huge amount in this particular area too. Um, and we'll do it through three particular things, I think. One is, is something when we call open doors, uh, which actually is in improving our ability to give people work experience <coughs> in technology. That we're going to provide inspiration. You've heard some of the things we do already in providing inspiration. Um, but what else can we do to actually show people what careers in technology are about and inspire them to come towards technology and digital as a career set? Um, and we'll also help in unlocking talent, which is a bit like the, the skills profile stuff you just heard about, which is actually helping people to understand what portfolio of skills they ought to get and how they can get those skills so they can be successful. So, I mean, wait for another year when we're, um, we're doing the same thing again and advertising what these skills achieve. Um, and I hope to have a very good story around this. Too. So with that, Andy. Great. Well, thank you very much, Ollie. And thank you very much, all of you, for your patience. Uh, I think this is a really important subject. You know, I personally believe that eSkills is a very effective organisation. We've heard some of the statistics. 136,000 people through complete computer clubs for girls. 21,000 people every year using the 14 to 19 year old website. These are big numbers. 850 students now doing the ITMB, getting work, adding value to the economy. 150 small businesses benefiting for what's going on on apprenticeships, which they couldn't otherwise do, thanks to people like BT and eSkills working together on those things. The IT professional standards we've talked about. And there are other things going on too, you know, working with Google, about 150,000 small companies have been able to make websites that they've not been able to do before. Um, and 114,000 people every year complete the eSkills UK user certificates. That's people using IT in their day-to-day -day life. But I'm ambitious. I think we're all very, very ambitious to do more. You know, I, b I see this as the, the core competitive issue that the UK faces. 
And if we're going to have an impact on you know, the added value of the UK, growth in the UK, if we're going to fully take our place in what's going on in the digital economy globally, we need to accelerate and scale up. So as we're drinking together and celebrating the achievements, I really would like you to think about what we could do to accelerate what's going on. I think, as Karen said, the tide is turning. The moment's here. I think there's a recognition on all sides of the political spectrum that laissez-faire won't crack it, that we need the skills, we need to make some decisions about where growth is going to come from. I think we see real energy around the idea of trying to make interventions that will make a real difference. We have the building blocks. We need the support, the ideas, the collaboration on how we can scale up in the education system, how we can scale up in the workplace, and how we can make a real difference to the way the UK economy grows and thrives going forward. It's a fantastic opportunity, as is a glass of wine. So thank you very much. Thank you.